Folks, I think we will make a start. So, to welcome once again, we are in week seven in Oxford. We've probably been nothing to you, or not in Oxford, but I'll tell you anyway. So, we are in week seven. This is our sixth speaker. We are honored to have Professor Esther Reed with us. She's Professor of Theological Ethics at the University of Exeter here in the UK, and she's the author of a number of texts including The Limits of Responsibility, Engaging Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the Global Era, TNT Clark 2018, Theology for International Law, TNT Clark again um, from 2013, I believe, um, and work with Baylor University Press, which is um, in 2010. But in addition to all of that, perhaps her most important identity, which is shared with myself, is that we are that comparative rarity of being lay Methodist theologians. Not many of us are around, but there are some Methodist lay theologians, and I'm indeed honoured to share that designation with Esther. So Esther, we are in your hands, um, and please share with us your thoughts on ethics in a new threat environment thinking with Fratelli Tutti. Anthony, Peter, other friends in the room, thank you so very much for the invitation. It's an honour. I must congratulate you on the cogency, the thematic cogency of the seminar programme that you've pulled together. I'm really impressed with it. And I do also want to mention before I start, um, Pamela Sue Anderson's name, I think when I was last in Regents Parks College, I spent some time with her. I do want to honour her memory just by mentioning her name. So um, thank you for that. Right. Um, does the destructive power of some weapons combined with other features of new weapons technology put beyond reach or deprive in some way the international community of its duty of justice? These big words, justice, peace, are with us, I think, of being with you throughout your seminar programme. I'm intensely mindful of Pope Francis's declarations, and I'm grateful to uh, Father Patrick for having shared his paper. I'm so sorry to have missed that. I'm so sorry to have missed Peter's paper. Had I been more organised and put the dates in my diary, I'd probably have joined, but I just omitted to do that. So please forgive my not doing that. I'm grateful to um, Father Reardon for sharing his uh, paper. And so he has spoken fairly recently on the details of some of Pope Francis's uh, recent uh, pronouncements etc around the Ukraine war so let's just recall the 2020 encyclical Fratelli Tutti saying it's very difficult nowadays um, to draw upon the criteria elaborated in earlier centuries to speak of the possibility of just war the very possibility of justice seems to be removed so what I'm wanting to do is kind of agree with Fratelli Tutti that a lot of this debate these days really does fall around the weapons technologies we've got to be, be engaging much more consistently and rigorously than I think that the just war tradition in classic mode has ever done really uh, we can have conversations why historically it hasn't done that um but so I, I want to agree with Fratelli Tutti that the weapons technology focus is really important and we need to lean in there but I am resisting the deprioritization of the imperative for uh, of the priority uh, against injustice or uh, uh, um, sorry, I'll say that again. I am resisting recent emphases in Roman Catholic social teaching, which appears to deprioritize the presumption against justice below the presumption against war. We need to hold those two better intentions. So what I'm trying to do in this talk is to romp through, I'm going to go fairly quickly through um, that launch pad from Fratelli Tutti through some questions that that raises, dropping in some theses along the way that I invite your consideration. I'm going to romp fairly quickly to um, leave us quite a bit of time, hopefully. So here is this statement, section 258 from Fratelli Tutti. Why can we no longer think of war as a solution because of a range of things? And it unpacks the permissiveness of just war teaching over the years. It unpacks um, issues around weapons technologies, notably the kind of 
indiscriminate massive destructive power of nuclear etc but um, hints at some other weapons technologies are also significant and also the effects of globalization such that the effects of war amplify poverty even in countries not directly affected by the fighting so these are the kind of three big concerns that I'm picking up from Fratelli Tutti which take away the possibility of using the criteria developed hitherto in Christian tradition and elsewhere, we might say across Judaism, Islam, etc. have that conversation um, around justice in war contexts and for our purposes also sub-war contexts. There are some additional concerns that I want to bring into play here um, that also complexify whether or not uh, those in Christian just war tradition, uh, moral theology and Christian tradition, etc., can employ any of those criteria familiar to us from the tradition. Um, additional to those concerns are the kind of whole messy thing around the language of competition continuum, grey zone, hybrid, cyber, etc. My warning, I suppose, and I'd love to talk about this in conversation, is to is is to, is to be very cautious about any of that language I think you know competition competition is not necessarily a bad thing competition continuum blurring that distinction between war and peace which I do want to maintain very clearly so my chosen my chosen discourse is war ethics and sub-war ethics let's have the conversation about how comfortable we are with the phrase conflict ethics um so but terminology is going to be really important here um but i certainly want to recognize that what advocates of these other terms competition continuum um persistent competition below the threshold of war etc are all um concerned about that the 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 issues there are very real ones even though we might want to watch the language there is an, um also another kind of complexifying factor around this multiplicity of theories attaching to the descriptor just war tradition what on earth are we talking about when we hear that phrase we can unpack you know are we talking about michael waltz's position are we talking about the new revisionist you know where do we go with all of that um and finally um uh, uh that the the whole thing that i've just mentioned the classic just war tradition paid very little attention to weapons technologies and much more focus is needed there if we are i think to pick up the very real and important moral challenge from fratelli tutti um that legitimate defense must be by military force always contained within rigorous conditions of moral legitimacy so a plea there for much more attention to weapons technologies. So this terminology business, I don't know where you land. It would be really interesting to hear where you land in terms of the technology. No vacuum is possible. I sometimes use conflict ethics, but that's mainly for pragmatic purposes, because in some contexts you just get you just don't get a hearing if you try and use the language of just war theory just war tradition that the door just closes sometimes when i sense that happening i will use the phrase conflict ethics but my concern always is to kind of bring us back to the discourse of justice in war ethics and sub-war ethics and to bring us back to the critically important moral distinction I posit between war and peace. To my mind, that moral distinction cannot be compromised. That moral distinction is needed to resist normalization of state-sanctioned use of lethal force between or among states. We we don't want to get to that situation where we, we are kind of in the slow boil conflict without war being declared. Um, I, it also provides for the activation of the law of armed conflict, international humanitarian law, which regulates relations between states, international organisations and other subjects of international law during the period that war persists. Now, intensely mindful of all the questions and challenges that are put to that. But in this room today, I'm saying, come on, friends, let's hold together. Let's maintain or at least have that big conversation about the need to maintain that clear uh, distinction between war and peace so to my mind it the cookie crumbles are like this is this an old-fashioned can this hold can this framework of discourse hold in the new threat environments I guess is one of our big questions today but I'm maintaining this distinction um, using here Oliver Donovan's uh, language in ordinary acts of judgment uh, which are 
free the war threshold as compared to extraordinary acts of judgment under the UN Charter, Article 51, um, and such like. Um, the thesis being, if people had time to explore it, that the tradition of Christian moral reasoning in just war tradition can handle both the distinction between war and peace and can handle something like a continuum. I'm resisting that word, but it's it's this kind of progression about crossing thresholds at various points, even the threshold beyond which there is no international authority competent to declare a war. I think we can handle this movement from domestic policing law and courts when, for instance, a magistrate's court in England and Wales will bump up a case to the Crown court because it crosses a threshold of severity all the way through to discussions about when cyber warfare crosses a threshold, rises to the level of armed conflict and gets into that um, uh, situation where it's it's triggered the law of armed conflict. But so I'm, I'm it, is this an impossible position to hold together that there is a moral distinction between war and peace and also recognizing these uh, realities of the new conflict environment? That's you know, that's kind of big challenge against which we're operating. To my mind, Christian moral theologians cannot compromise on there being a moral distinction between war and peace. That's foundational to conflict ethics and Christian perspectives because God's will is for peace. God's peace is the ontological truth of creation. That again is a phrase from Oliver O'Donovan, whose work I'm very, very ready and happy to acknowledge. God's peace is the goal of history, a practical demand laid upon us um, and also a natural desire in all creation. So one of the kind of strands of what I'm trying to do is to kind of re-engage, to dig back into the ethical naturalism of Thomas Aquinas and such like dig back into those precepts of natural law reasoning to re-engage these questions in the new threat environment. So thesis two, precepts of the natural law can be reflected in human law. I talked in Theology for International Law about this tension, how there is no kind of conduit between the divine eternal law and human law, human rights law, whatever law it might be. There's no kind of you know, direct downward slide from one to the other. We don't have that. But nonetheless, we can, I think, use still Thomas's language of participation of human law in the divine law to the extent that it reflects something of divine law. So here, yeah, you know, I will still work quite overtly and clearly with um, UN Charter articles, etc. But I'm no international lawyer and I, I typically bow to the expertise of any international lawyers who might be in the room. <clears throat> So how then does this peace versus war framework work in the new threat environment? Can it? Um, to my mind, the, the big word here, which I haven't got on the screen, is threshold. We need to have uh, and to be kind of testing that language of threshold. It's a difficult word to maintain um, in some context. Here is a document that was published really just a few days ago. It's an impact assessment from the Home Office shared with MOD, I think, around um, the impact of the National Security Bill, um, looking at some of the interfaces between national security in a domestic context and intelligence context and in the um, international context under international law. And, you know, these discourses are very much coming together. We cannot pull one apart from the other. Can then we maintain this distinction between war and peace in this kind of context? There's a lot of pressure to say that it doesn't hold. There's a lot of pressure uh, to suggest that the conceptual framework that we need these days is the competition for survival and advantage framework and that the distinction between war and peace is uh oh and here here is a nice phrase from major general retired sir andrew sharp um he's he's one of these people who says you know just forget this nonsense about you know this good old-fashioned nonsense that held in the medieval period uh, the, the 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 tone that we need today is not one of the reluctant opposer of as an existential threat, i.e., you know, Russia has violated international law and needs to be stopped before it, 
you know, does even worse things. The tone is rather more positive than that. I mean, it's a really interesting use of the word positive there and suggest a policy direction, a capability set and a doctrinal approach in which, and it was there, the UK basically, but I took that out because it kind of applies everywhere. I've, I've inserted XXS, would seek to compete, not to win because it sees this as a constant, never ending, unwinnable competition, but rather to compete and stay ahead. So discourse there about, you know, the, the, is victory still a concept that we can use? What is victory going to look like? I'm going to want to argue in this book that I hope to write at some point. I'm very much at the beginning of it rather than the end of it right now. So you must forgive me for that. But I'm really grateful for the opportunity to share these. You know, the, the victory theory, we're going to need to know what victory is going to look like and victory might look very different from it did in previous it might just look like some kind of maintenance of a of a moderately uh livable in peaceable world order um and of course we've got this big question about how to attend how to contend with adversaries who do not recognize the same thresholds so this is all part of the discourse that we are part of the context in which we are operating and I want to say to you that the ideal of justice speaks to the human dignity and equality and norms of non-maleficence I've argued so far just briefly that we need to maintain the distinction between war and peace we need to think about those that term peace um, and we need to think about the concept of justice we cannot relinquish the duty of justice in the international arena uh, why? Because um, it speaks of human dignity and equality. It speaks of the duty of love to protect the innocent. It speaks of the right of self-defense, which both of which claims I think we can derive from the Holy Scriptures. And it speaks of the role of secular government to exercise judgment and discriminate between right and wrong. So I'm going to have those theological arguments um, with people um, who who don't hold that let's have the discussion but that's why I am not yielding up. I'm not I'm not yielding what it appears that Fratelli Tutti wants us to yield so another of my kind of big overarching questions I've got too many of them I know you know what service does the church owe the international community given these questions about threshold conditions given everything that we've said about the new threat environment I'm maintaining that the church owes to the international community its witness, its recognition of God-ordained responsibilities for earthly governance, for the enactment of justice, establishment and maintenance of peaceable order. I'm pretty Augustinian in that. Um, uh, we owe the international community an ecclesial ministry of warning, of condemnation, of renunciation and lament. And if we have people in the room today who lead worship, I would love to hear from you about the prayers that you pray, that you lead your intercessory prayers right now. Because, again, one of the things I want to be doing is be kind of re reworking, rethinking Christian ethics as an extension of the church's ministry of intercession. I'm sticking with this bias to those who are most vulnerable, bias to those whose human rights are being violated and suggesting that um, a service owed by the church to the international community is an articulation of natural law norms nl equals natural law and guiding principles but not the policy formulation so that's a kind of fairly traditional classic kind of pulling back from the minutiae of of policy engagement whilst um you know still kind of sticking out there with the, with the big guidelines <sighs> okay so the church owes a service of natural law reasoning to the international community as it develops, as it continues to develop customary international laws in this new threat environment. That's I'm kind of working through this paper with this kind of theses one after another. Um, owes a service of natural law reasoning. I can't do that alone. You know, I'm just so grateful to be part of this, this conversation that you've got in the room. Please keep me involved in the conversation if it's, you know, if it's going anywhere after this, I, I so want to join with friends and colleagues um, who are engaging these debates. The model of service, I think that's going to differ upon the nature of the ministry. I'm speaking to some church leaders on Wednesday and uh, you know, those senior church leaders will have models of service that might be very different from those those who are predominantly academic sitting in the room today, if the model of, of leadership exercised in the church is that of a bishop or of a priest or of a pastor in some kind, then the ministry of service might well be one of accompaniment of, of 
lay people in the congregation who are facing some really difficult decisions. So I am kind of putting that ministry of accompaniment very much on the table alongside the, the more familiar prophetic, priestly, kingly solidarity and those ministries derived from Christ Jesus. And this service of natural law reasoning i think because of the peculiar natures of new weapons technologies is very much going to be focused around risk we're going to need to be much more comfortable in thinking about statistics uh, than ever your, your standard uh, christian ethicist is you know i we, we've got to be getting in that game uh, we've got to be kind of recognizing that the tough questions that um, the intelligence services are facing etc around attribution we've got to be getting back to that discussion around deterrence because we haven't done that debate well enough um and, and as well as this this focus on the peculiarities of new weapons technologies <clears throat> so we could spend more time talking about how i think the uh Christian ethics agenda lying ahead has to be an extension of the church's ministry of prayer, but I will skip that for the moment, but keen to talk about that if you want. So where are we? I'm with, I'm heeding Fratelli Tutti's discourse that it is really difficult nowadays to invoke the rational criteria elaborated in earlier centuries to speak of the possibility of a just war. I don't want that to allow us to mean that we ha cannot have, we are precluded from having the conversation about justice in war context and sub-war context. Um, I'm, I'm here though with Fratelli Tutti talking about the moral labour of distinguishing between justifiable, sorry they don't talk about this but I'm, tr I'm trying to pick up some of their moral concerns to talk about the, the difference between justifiable and non-justifiable use of military force because that remains a practical demand of peace required for judgment uh, the, the practical demand of peace that requires judgment against wrongdoing you can't have one without the other we can't separate one from the other so if we want to kind of dig into the academic literature here i basically i'm pretty much with james johnson turner who excoriates the intellectual deterioration of just war tradition in recent tradition recent years um, and he was arguing that way back in the kind of 1990s i'm i'm with you uh, James Johnson. Um, there's been some more recent updates, I think some really good quality updates by Gregory Reichberg in this book, um, uh, the, the concluding chapter of Thomas Aquinas on War and Peace, which kind of engages this tension with some recent Roman Catholic social teaching and kind of says, well, you know, it's not quite as dreadful as somebody like James Johnson Turner might um, suppose. There are some, you know, residual um, concerns about justice that we can um, hold on to that I think is that's what where Gregory lands and um, uh, Nick uh, Christian Nicholas Braun whom I think um, Father Reardon mentioned I'm pretty much with um, Christian Braun um, defending just war thinking as an integral past as it's encountered in Thomas Aquinas needed uh, to encompass the discourse of ethics and war so I'm basically with with uh, Christian there so where are we? Precepts of the natural law will guide with respect to risk, attribution, deterrence, weapons and technologies. That, I suppose, is my kind of leap of faith right now. Um, I, I am walking into future discourses at various in various contexts, external to the university context, in the sincere hope <laughs> that I'm not going to be... Um, let down in this kind of step of faith in some respects that you know as we walk together into the future with these difficult questions about when an attack on a computer network amounts to a use of force whether or when shared community values underlying the your sad bellum regarding peaceable just order include computer network infrastructure so that you know that whole kind of cyber thing gets really complicated um, whether and when an attack on a computer network should be deemed to amount to um, a use of force um, such that the United Nations Security Council may determine that it threatens peace. You know, all of these questions are out there. <clears throat> um, and I think where they are pushing us, and I want to um, kind of use my... Uh, second half of the presentation to talk about new weapons technology specifically kind of ai enabled whatever we mean by ai we'll get into that in a minute um the the specific issues raised by weapons technology so we could do the nuclear thing we could do um uh, the cyber thing i want to i want to talk sp more specifically in this concluding section about kind of ai enabled weapons technologies on the or in the battle space 
um, do weapons technologies, new weapons that render the exercise of judgment by proper authority so morally problematic as to be incompatible with the divine law and peace building. So basically, the service owed by the international community, is that going to be a kind of whacking huge great a plea for a moratorium, a, a complete and outright ban on some of these new technologies, which tech weapons? technologies if so and to my mind that really takes us to the question of whether the technology entails inherently unethical decisions and actions marla in say now or oh, we could spend the whole bothering session here um do ai weapons technologies and in part i'm kind of calling on a, on a paper that i wrote for the society for the study of christian ethics last september so i have written on this more expansively uh, recently and basically my position is no i do not hold to the position that these ai enabled weapons technologies that put a machine between the uh, particular decision taken by a, a human being a chain of command to execute a target and the weapon firing against that target is renders the use of this weapons inherently unethical to my mind the involvement of the weapon in that space is not inherently evil because to my mind human dignity doesn't so much require that this, this just sounds so awful to say but you know if, if we're in this warfare context doesn't so much require that a human being pull the trigger as that the consequence of that trigger being pulled mean that a person isn't mistakenly killed that if I'm in warfare, if I'm a combatant, if I am in the line of fire, what matters more, um, or if I'm a, if I'm a, a non-combatant in in the line of fire, what matters more is is not so much that I am the trigger is pulled by a robotic um, uh, piece of equipment, um, but that my life is not taken unnecessarily or in violation of international law. So does the technology entail inherently unethical decisions and actions and or does human dignity require that a human being pull the trigger? Are human responsibility, supervision and encounter accountability impossible to exercise? So we've got here a distinction between something um, intrinsic and something contingent. My where I'm falling on this is to say that it's the um, there is nothing intrinsic to this weaponry which precludes its use, but there are lots and lots of contingent considerations which are um, central to our considerations and need to be subject to rigorous um, regulation. So, does the technology entail inherently unethical decisions and actions? Or is the ethical status of these machines contingent upon design features, supervision and review, etc.? And the line I'm taking is that it is contingent upon um, considerations around accountability, predictability, performance, um, whether the data is capable of interrogation, whether the data is capable of uh, whether the, the, the uh, chain of command, etc., are uh, capable of compliance reporting, oversight, compliance enforcement. Um, I'm concerned about adequate supervision. I'm concerned about when this technology might be used to excuse human beings from the exercise of moral agency. So my concerns really here are the contingent concerns of whether human responsibility, supervision and accountability can be assured rather than whether the technology presents inherently unethical decisions because my proposition to you in the room is, is no, it doesn't. So why do I get to this point? Well, because I want to be really clear that all AI systems are manufactured artifacts for which regulation is required. I am quite deeply concerned that at times church groups, as much as some other kind of campaigning groups, have bought into the anthropomorphism, bought into the hype, which almost suggests that there is some new ontological category here. I think that is 
decidedly problematic. I think actually the Holy See did some really useful work on definitions of um, AI enabled autonomous weapon systems in in the in the twenty tens um, when it was kind of you know really doing some very fine nitty gritty dis, uh, definition which at the time was infinitely preferable or considerably preferable to the UK's position which was. Um, overplayed and deeply problematic for reasons that we can explore if you want um but i'm really concerned that we don't kind of buy into this kind of hype around killer robots because that phrase killer robot could mean a whole host of things it could mean this kind of you know red buzzy eyes um it's kind of you know some sort of new ontological category of being or it could mean um something much more precise which is uh given in say this these definitions which um, are giving you what i think is the best here about your own um Maris, Maria Rousseau, Tadio, and Alexander Blanchard, and also um, uh, what's he called, Floridi, um, in in your own Oxford, who, who to my mind are doing some really the, the best international work on this field at the moment. So what they've done is to give a really useful uh, overview of definitions of autonomous weapon systems across um, NATO and other uh, countries and offered some kind of um, amalgam of what they think is the best definition and so they, they've offered here their be the behavior of autonomous weapons is teleonomic that means it tends to certain specific ends um, so it's programmed to achieve certain ends in that sense it's teleonomic um, but it has certain internal constraints internal conditions which can change according to how it interacts with the environment how it perceives or interprets its environment um, including other weapons around it swarm weapons etc um, so uh, interactivity with environment um, and adaptability is integral to their definition of autonomy. So, But what I'm wanting to hold to is that all AI systems are manufactured artifacts for which regulation is required. I really don't want us to go down the road of some kind of, you know, uh, unnecessary and deeply problematic, I think, language, loose language around killer robots and such like. So... Concerns, where are we? Um, ethical concerns, I think, were very around autonomous weapons, were very wisely put. And I'm looking here now at Holy See contributions, especially to the CCW, which is the Convention on um, Certain Conventional Weapons, their kind of annual biannual review of um, Article 36 protocols and uh, kind of constraints uh, that, that what's needed in the new tech. A new legal framework to keep up to date with the technology so in the ccw and i probably should have put in another slide so sorry about that um so the holy see has been making some really good um contributions here 2016 they had a paper which was listing lack of cons lack of human vision uh, supervision in targeting as a really important concern. One can think of systems capable of learning and reprogramming um, that would allow an armed autonomous robot to redefine itself and to redefine the objective that it must achieve without the mediation of human control. Now, if that were to happen, that would be a really, real big problem. Uh, it was talking uh, back in 2016 about lack of predictability of the behavior of the robot. Yes, excellent. I really need that. It was talking about characteristics of the environment in which it operates. So risk of hacking or the use of these systems being taken over. Uh, it was talking about stimulation of an armed race. It was talking about psychological impact of these weapons on people who use them so i really want to kind of lean in behind all of these concerns and say yes we really do need these these workers part of this kind of ongoing history of what was happening at the ccw we did get in 2019 a really quite important um achievement i think in uh, a list of a to k guiding principles Again, if we've got any international lawyers in the room, um, you will speak better to these than me, but I've just pulled out A to D here. Um, international humanitarian law continues to apply fully to all weapon systems. Human accountability for decisions on the use of weapon systems must be retained. Human responsibility must be retained, yes. Um, uh human this this kind of runs across the whole life cycle of the weapon from you know commissioning all the way through to use and accountability thereafter and accountability you know, this proposition d accountability for developing deploying and using any emerging weapon system in the framework of the ccc must be ensured in accordance with compliance now see really good guiding principles established in 2019 the problem is that there's been an impasse ever since in working out what they mean in practice um so 
there have been other people playing in the field since then. The Canberra Working Group had some really good principles in 2020, to which they added, in addition to all the, to the ones in 20, they added principle of reasonable foreseeability, principle three there, um, and principle four, the use of laws should enhance, should enhance control over desired outcomes. So basically something like the Arkin test, that the outcome should be better than you would expect from uh, a human um, using the same kind of weaponry. So, you know, I, I kind of lean in and support those. Um, this is an important statement, I think, really, to my mind, one of the best uh, contributions from the Holy See um, to the CCW in December 2021. Um, this is a pull out of this kind of three paragraphs and their conclusion adequate human supervision means well done for kind of you know working trying to push through to what these mean meaningful human decision implies consistent human supervision entails so to my mind that's a really kind of helpful contribution that was made there um there has been the icrc which is still kind of Oh, and I don't. There might be people in the room who hold this, and certainly your speaker next week might well hold this position. So we've still got to have these conversations. But you know, they are saying that unpredictable weapons auton autonomous should be prohibited. I mean, yes, I agree that unpredictable weapons should be or prohibited. Do I agree with that second recommendation that autonomous weapons that are designed and used to apply force against people directly should be prohibited? I mean. The Lord Almighty only knows I wish that we could realistically have that as a meaningful prohibition. I mean, wouldn't that just be helpful if we could? I think that the it's not achievable. So do I go out with my kind of, oh, I'm going to be provocative here, you know, do I do my kind of pious hand waving, um, you know, plea that these weapons should be prohibited when I basically in my heart of hearts just think we're a long way it's, it's beyond possibility that we would ever achieve them um i think not so where are we now this is 2022 in uh, the ccw lack of progress impasse the states actually want to make progress do we know broadly what these we do know broadly what ethical frameworks are required. There is this kind of broad-based consistency across ethical frameworks, which is, so we basically know what is required, but do we know what any of these means? So um, John Williams from Durham wrote a snappy little piece um, called Effective, Deployable and Accountable. Pick two. You basically get two of those options. And I suppose what I want to do is kind of pull, push for accountability um, if necessary in at the expense of efficacy and deployability that is not going to you know sit well with uh, with a whole load of parties and for of very obvious reasons but you know i just where i'm coming down is that we cannot really compromise on the accountability because otherwise justice in the battle space is is devastatingly compromised so what prospects ha! um article 36 um the campaigning organization basically says you know, he, he used expletives he used expletives in in recounting this in the podcast a handful of militarized states drive civilian protection off the agenda he's saying that since 2019 there has been no progress at all in working out what the guidelines actually mean and so rather than stepping up and speaking in favor of international law and building up um some of these big players are just kowtowing to this erosion of protections that are already in place so if you've watched any of the videos that are um, uh, publicly available, um, sorry, I missed that. If you watched any of the videos that are publicly available um, uh, of the CCW, you can see the chair there just hanging his head in despair. You know, the interjections by Russia were nothing other than, you know, delaying of conversation. China really wasn't getting in there and exercising any serious leadership. It's a very devastating, very depressing watching online so what have we got we've got people then like george lucas who kind of bypass the whole international law debate and go straight to the um industry this book concludes with a list of principles for the industry because he thinks that you know again god help us you know that our moral protections are currently in the hands of the weapons uh, and defence industry that are designing these things because, you know, we've just got to only hope that there are some people there who are actually concerned about the ethics of what's going on. So what service, again, does the church owe to the international community? If there are no mala in, say, preclusion against lethal autonomous weapon systems, as I'm saying that there are not, is the 
obligation owed by the church to the international community and i'm yeah i'm talking kind of big church here because organizations like the holy see are there present as church institution of course we all die you know diversify uh, as individuals as to where and how we conduct our vocations or follow our vocations um but i'm looking for i'm speaking especially for the churches as institutions whether they should be pressing for a general moratorium pressing for a limited moratorium i.e that laws designated and used to apply force against a people also going with the the um, icrc position overt pressure for a new protocol to the ccw or another legally binding agreement to enshrine broad broadly agreed principles i mean that's where i am that's where i'm what i'm kind of pushing for as well as perhaps overt and behind closed doors acceptance that a legally binding agreement is not currently within reach, but really kind of pushing for that diplomatically. And or um, for those people who are pastors in the room, uh, church leaders, you know, looking for that concentration of pastoral work in supporting the individual whose vocation is as a, as a politician, diplomat, lawyer, activist or such like. So where I think the Holy See is superb at that work is in Laudato Si, where in it, the context of the climate emergency, it's calling so fluently, so eloquently for global regulatory norms, for strong institutions, for diplomatic efforts, for a politics which is far-sighted and capable. It's calling for all of these things in these textual references, which, you know, my just heart warms when it is calling for these things, but they're not calling for them. They're not really kind of leading leaning in on the weapons control agenda as vocally as they're doing on the climate change agenda. So, you know, I'm still with John Paul II's call for a renewal of the international legal order. I'm still praying that individuals and nation states learn afresh the grammar of the international law, a plea for a greater degree of international ordering. And is it still, you know, that naive rem reminder that respect for the law is, is necessary for the maintenance of peace in the new international order law favours peace i am still there with john paul ii mm. um, but intensely mindful that we don't really have a robust ethic either of conflict ethics um in that kind of sub-war um situation or really an ethic of weapons control and so there is a massive job here um, for the multi-faith endeavor an ethic of to date no ethic of weapons control unites major faith traditions across their respective quests for justice and the protection of innocent victims or rightful beneficiaries of protections and so whilst much of today's international law has religious roots stretching right back to talmudic teachers the great rabbis of jewish history early medieval church lawyers and the great figures in the legal literature of islam you know we really need to kind of have that renewal again of those discourses we need to be rebuilding conflict ethics or ethics uh, in the war and sub-war um, spheres with these key considerations, or these key obligations upon Christian people um, that I mentioned earlier in the talk. And I would argue to pray, especially as we learn from, as academics learn from and with those people in the room who are leading worship and engaging those prayers of intercession, what are we praying for? And I think we are praying especially for deliverance from failures with respect to accountability for the taking of human life, failures for accountability to respect human dignity. This comes to us from the Genesis 5.9, um, you know, post the, the flood, the global reset after the flood, the requirement for the reckoning of bloodshed at the hand of every human being, that is really where I'm looking to, to sit. And we need then to do that detailed work that Luciano Floridi, uh, Maria So oh, I can start, can't say her name, I'm sorry, um, Maria Tadio and other colleagues are doing around the specifics of accountability and in in artificial intelligence. If anybody's kind of can dig into those specifics of authority recognition, interrogation, um, you know, the context range, agents, uh, all of that kind of specifics about what accountability in AI means, I should be deeply grateful. So where am I? Um, I am with Fratelli Tutti in well, I'm against Fratelli Tutti in the discussions that we've heard, or I'm resisting some of the possible interpretations of what Pope Francis said there. But I'm so with Fratelli Tutti and this 
um, consideration here, since conditions that favour the outbreak of wars are once again increasing, I can only reiterate that war is the negation of all rights and a dramatic assault on the environment. I mean, war is madness. I completely get that. But to this end, there is need to ensure the uncontested rule of law and tireless recourse to negotiation, mediation and arbitration as proposed by the Charter of the United Nations, which constitutes a truly f fundamental juridical norm. So this is where I am. Um, we really need to hold fast to arguments from human dignity. These are central to the rebuilding of conflict and sub-war ethics and to weapons control and Christian perspective. Spiritual quietism undermines arguments from human dignity. Um, and of course, I'm mindful that all sides in a conflict are likely to claim that their war is just. But nonetheless, um, the ideal of justice in conflict and sub-war ethics must be maintained as a way of speaking of human dignity, of maintaining the equality of status that all human beings enjoy by virtue of their existence and expressing norms of non-maleficence. And because of the intrinsic connections um, to law between justice and law and institutionalized legal practices. And there's my icon, the icon that I, it was not my icon, I didn't paint it, but the icon that I keep in front of me as I try to consider these issues today. Thank you so very much for your patience.